Hey YouTubers, Facebookers and Instagrammers, I'm back to make another video. It's been some time since I made a video just due to being so incredibly busy. Um, I thought today I would cover uh, what it is to buy a working cocker or springer. You know, the popularity of them is massive now and understanding uh, what a working cocker is really, really key. So I'm gonna break it down into parts. I'm gonna do some other videos uh, later to follow as well. There's so many different things to uh, cover that I'm trying to, gonna try and cover as much of it as I can, but sort of segmentize it down into bits. So today I'm predominantly gonna talk about is a cocker or springer. Um, the reason I'm saying cocker is predominantly probably 80% of the dogs that I look after and clients that I look after are cockers, but um, cockers and springers are the spaniels that we're looking at today and whether they're right or wrong for you. So understanding what a working spaniel is. So a working spaniel has been bred to hunt, find, flush, and potentially retrieve game that's been shot. So that might be pheasants, partridges, rabbits, hares, etc. Understanding the game drive in these dogs is very, very key. I'm gonna cover this down a little bit further in some of the uh, parts that I'm gonna talk about in a minute. Um, but first of all, understanding that working cocker, it's slightly different from your domestic breed. So one of the things that I'm saying um, all the time is that your modern domestic bred dog, most of its prey drive and ability to find things to feed itself has, has long gone now. But in a working cocker and a springer and some Labradors and HPRs, hunt point retrievers, this drive is still there. Now, when you buy a Spaniel, you can't always be sure how much drive is in that dog. One of the things that we'll look at is the pedigree, how many champions might be in it, how it's bred, and then we can have a look at how much drive potentially is gonna be in there. But you can even on paper buy a dog that's not particularly uh, special, but still could have a lot of drive in it. And that's one of those things when you go buy an eight week old puppy, you can never be quite sure what you're buying at that point. And often it's not till two, two and a half years old that you get that full, uh, full amount of cocker coming through. So a year old, I made videos on this before, by the way, a year old, you could be folded into this, uh, sorry, fold into this uh, false sense of security that you're in control. But really at that point, that dog hasn't found its feet and got going yet. I'm often saying to clients, you really don't know what the ceiling is on your dog's natural ability to find game. And the reason why I'm talking about game is because it's the number one issue long term that I deal with as a spa especially a spaniel trainer. And one of the things I'm always saying to people, it doesn't matter that you've put a collar on your dog and said it's a pet. Doesn't exempt you, now this is key, doesn't exempt you from the issues that are prevalent in this breed and you have to understand that. Okay, that's really, really key. So I'm gonna talk about some other things now, some of the, the parts of those traits that go with that. So al allowing your dog's natural instinct to develop without controlling and manipulating that, you're not, your dog's natural instinct is to get in a pen like this, you can't see it, but it's out to the side here, lovely cover for a spaniel to get in, hedge rows, cover, scent to find. If allowed to explore its natural instincts, your dog wants to hunt, find, chase, potentially catch, and maybe even eat. If you allow that natural instinct to flow, and that's what ends up happening without people realizing it, that's when you're in an awful lot of trouble. So a lot of what I'm doing at the beginning when I'm coaching my clients, whether in person, and I do an awful lot of online coaching, look after people as far as North America, Northern Europe, Denmark, Sweden, Belgium, all over the place. Doesn't matter where you are, we're still, our main concern long term is developing and controlling uh, the freedom in and around us. I've made videos on this, I might put some links in the description below. But the main issue, as I just said, is these dogs wanting to find, chase, catch and potentially eat. That is our number one issue that we're trying, or I am trying to protect my clients again. And so the training that we do is slightly different from a domestic pet. There's got to be a lot of restrictions in place. Okay, so as I said, those main traits are for these dogs is getting their nose down, hunting, finding, and getting away from us. I'm often saying to people, the difference between reality and Instagram, for example, Instagram is out, dog running around, lovely, lovely, all coming back, being interactive with us. Reality is a cold, wet Tuesday afternoon in a wood when your dog's gone and you're trying to find it. And it's quite heartbreaking and very scary at times. But it's a message that I get from people day in, day out. Every day I get messages from people saying, hey, we've watched some of your other videos. Everything you've said that we shouldn't have done, we did. And everything we've got uh, now is what you said we potentially could have. 
And so my job is to try and help and protect people against that. But it's almost like sometimes there's a big red button that says there, don't press me. People want to press it and find out. The problem is when you press that button and then you find out at a novice level, I would say on, on average, it's very, very, very hard to come back from that. And people often end up only being able to walk their dog on the lead the rest of their lives. And that is a fundamental difference between buying a working spaniel or even some of the other breeds within that working, work, working category, sorry, and buying maybe a poodle or a staffery or a doberman or an alsatian, all those other breeds of dogs that have different traits but don't have this massive hunt drive game issue. Right, differences from the domestic pets. I think that covers some of that there. So what I'm saying is again, for example, if you buy a more domesticated breed dog, you can get away with a lot of things you can't get away with a Spaniel. So there's a balance of integration against restriction. So bringing up a working Spaniel, I try and use a crate in the house much like I would using a kennel. Got to remember these dogs 10, 15 years ago weren't really massively in the domestic sector like they are now. So traditionally using kennels, you can bring them up uh, and start training them a lot later than you can in the house. Bringing them up in the house, you don't have a choice but to start training them a lot earlier. A lot of pro trainers might not be really doing much apart from a tiny bit of lead work, maybe a few retrieves here and there till six, seven, eight months old. Traditionally, you'll hear people saying, oh, you know, don't start training these dogs too soon. But in the household environment, you don't really have a choice. But I would still use a crate like that because in the early stages, I really want to keep my dog on blinkers. And what I mean by that is I want my dog to know no more than I need it to know. As soon as you show that dog something that it doesn't need to know about, for example, a squirrel in the garden, which I really don't want, it's hard to take that away. And then you're starting to kick off some of those natural instincts, which at the beginning I'm trying to keep under control until other things are in place. I don't want to go too much on a tangent of different things because there's so many different things to cover. But essentially, in these early months, I'm trying to keep things really, really restricted. I have quite a set order that I like to work through things, and it's not often how people might think it would be. Often people come to you thinking they're gonna do heel, sit, stay. That's not what's protecting you long term. By the way, I've done a video on recall, so often people will say to me, oh, you know, recalls are one of the things I want to work on. I'll put a link in the description for that. Uh, have a look down through and you can see my video on magic recall. Okay, but it's not about recall, it's about giving your dog stimulation. These dogs are very fit, they can do a lot of exercise even at a young age, but that doesn't make it right. And that's one of the things I try to keep under control. A lot of people say, you know, we're a super active family, we do a lot of walking. That slightly scares me because it often means that they want to do way too much too soon and they might get away with it for a certain amount of time. They might get away with it completely forever. And there's always going to be 10, 15% of people that might do very little training and might say, hey Chris, we didn't do anything you said and our dog's great, brilliant. But as a professional trainer, if you come to me, I'll only ever tell you the right way to do it. And I don't take risks. I always try and do things uh, as best as I can and coach people through it. It might be quite slow. That's one of the other things that people have to understand. Um, with my online coaching, one of the things in, in, the, in the information pack that I give people is me talking about reducing the speed of people's expectation when they're training. It's a lot slower and you have to have an incredible amount of patience. As soon as you lose that patience, um, you can get yourself into all sorts of trouble because you start doing things that I wouldn't be doing at that stage, which is really, really key. So on average, the reality is, even at a year old, you'll have had that dog for almost 10 months and you'll feel like you've had that dog forever. And yet at that point, 10 months, a year, 14 months, your dog's natural instinct still is only just starting to get going potentially. Yes, there'll be dogs that are hunting and getting about really young, six, eight months, but a lot of them it's not till 18, 20 months. So at that point, you might feel that you're long gone finished. And yet suddenly out of nowhere, this dog is getting away from you and you're struggling to get it back. And that's one of the things that you have to understand. Okay, so often saying to people in a pure shooting sense, a dog in its first season at maybe 18 to 24 months out, uh, old, when it first starts going out working, will be a very different dog the following year. So I like to keep my dog super tight in its first year. That knowing that the second year the dog's going to lower a little bit too much and is going to want to get about a bit more and so having that restriction that first year gives you a better chance of holding on to that dog. Um, 
So those are a mixture of different things that you have to take into account when you are buying a working cocker. Like I say, the main thing is understanding the number one issue long term is this chasing, dogs getting away from you. And so all the training we do in those early months is real key. Uh, they don't need tons of exercise, they need their brain stimulating. That's the number one thing that I say to people. Um, and I often like to try, if I can, to do that through retrieving. I've done videos on saying why retrieving is so important. Regardless of whether you end up using that retrieving long term, it's a great way to stimulate your dog's mind, interact with your dog, develop training um, and uh, respect from the dog for you. Um, it also, there's always going to be times when the dog gets something and you want to get it back to you. So being able to get the dog back to you when it doesn't want to come back to you with something it might have is real crucial. And the earlier you can get that retrieve delivery, the better. Um, so in those early stages, all I wanted to do is keep that dog very, very naive. There's certain bits I definitely want to do, something I call enrichment. I talk about that um, a lot with my online clients. Um, and there's a very small amount of specific stuff that we're doing and an awful lot of trying to avoid stuff in the early months. And that's the bit that people will probably often make the mistake on. Everyone wants to get out and do what I call the fluffy, cloudy walks. Absolutely, I get it. I understand why people get go and get those dogs. They have that desire, that dream of how that looks for them. But if you get a Cocker or a Springer, you have to hold back on that because if you do not do your training correctly, you often will get your fingers burned. I often, an analogy I use a lot of the time, if you've only just taught your child to do a bit of doggy paddle to the side, you don't just suddenly chuck them off the end of the pier and expect it to go well. Same with the dog, you've got to put a lot of time into them um, to get that respect back out of the dog and to have a well disciplined trained dog. Anyway, if you want any further help, uh, I do an awful lot of online training. As I said, you can uh, go through to my Facebook page, Hampshire Spaniel Training. Drop me a message in there. I can send you some information through. And if you want some help, I can do my best to help you. Don't forget to give me a thumbs up on a follow on uh, YouTube. It really does help me. Um, and it helps me push on to create more content for you guys. Hopefully going to do some more we uh, videos in the weeks to come now, covering some of the other aspects early on, if and as you decide to buy a working cocker. Anyway, I hope this has been helpful and I'll catch you very soon guys.